is on. So we are live and I'm Stephen Petro coming to you from Hillsborough, North Carolina tonight. Welcome. Happy holidays, whatever holiday it is you celebrate. I'm like the biggest Jew for Christmas, as you can see. This is a real tree. Eric was asking me a little <laughs> bit earlier. And I think it's because of, of the lights, uh, the brightness, and uh, in sort of folklore, they protect us. And I think this year, perhaps we all need a little bit uh, more protection than, than in, in, in previous years. Uh, I am joined by Eric Weiner, who is in Falls Church, Virginia. Hello, Eric, and Susan Jameson, who is in Roanoke, Virginia. And uh, I want to thank Kim Doty, who is our technical producer, who is our producer, and she is behind the scenes. Uh, she will be um, watching the comments, and I want you all to know that you can post um, in the comment field if you have questions. We'll be taking questions for both Eric and Susan after their two presentations. And one thing I would like you all to think about is, uh, What's one thing you're going to do to try to get through the next couple of months, to try to get through this winter? And I'm thinking about everything kind of hanging over us, the darkness, the COVID, the elections, the inauguration, and um, and, and whatever else, all of us have you know, things going on. And um, and before I introduce Eric formally, I'm going to, I'm going to exert my host privilege and um, I'm dedicating tonight's Fireside series to um, Katie Ferris, who is a poet, who is a BCCA fellow, and who just finished chemotherapy this week. And um, Katie, you are in our hearts. And, um, and I'm eating a lot of cake, which you have asked us to do to celebrate the end of your chemo. So, Eric. Um, Eric is the author of two New York Times bestsellers, the Geography of Bliss and the Geography of Genius. And I know you wrote one of them or part of one of them at VCCA, um, as well as the critically acclaimed Men Seeks God, or is that Man Seeks God, and your latest book, The Socrates Express, In Search of Life Lessons from Dead Philosophers, which I think was just named one of NPR's best books for 2020. Um, Eric, it's wonderful to see you again. I remember drinking bourbon with you in one of our studios at the end of long days. We, Many were, we, well. were, fellow, we were fellow fellows, and fellow fellows. I remember that time fondly, and you were very supportive and of good cheer, and um, it's good to see you again. Likewise. So um, tell us a little bit of what you're going to read to us tonight. So, um, you know, asking uh, an author to choose what to read is sort of like asking a starving man um, which part of the all-you-can-eat buffet he wants to start with, you know? Um, so I just instinctively went for um, chapter 11. Now, I should say that all the chapters of this book begin with a simple how-to question. So chapter one is how to get out of bed, like Marcus Aurelius, the, the Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher. How to wonder like Socrates, how to see like Thoreau. Um, and I take you through to the questions that are more relevant as we get a bit longer of tooth, not that any of us are old here, to be clear, but one of those questions uh, that's essential to a good life, I think, is how to have no regrets. And the philosopher guide for this chapter is Friedrich Nietzsche. And um, I'm going to read uh, sort of the best of from that chapter. Uh, and we'll take it from there. Are we ready? We're ready. All right, here we go. Groundhog Day is my favorite movie by a mile. I must have watched it dozens of times. Groundhog Day is my favorite movie by a mile. I must have watched it dozens of times. Groundhog Day is my favorite movie by a... You get the idea. I haven't merely watched the movie. I've communed with it, imbibed its ethos. I loved it when it first came out in 1993. I loved it before it before it became a cultural meme, before people used the word meme in conversation. I still love it more than ever. The protagonist is a curmudgeonly TV weatherman named Phil Connors, who, as you know, is stuck in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, reliving down Groundhog Day over and over. Now, the movie is classified as a romantic comedy, 
But Groundhog Day is, I believe, the most philosophical movie ever made. As Phil Connors wrestles with the blessing and the curse that are his eternally recurring day, he also wrestles with philosophy's major themes. What constitutes moral action? Do we possess free will or are our lives fated? How many blueberry pancakes can a grown man eat without exploding? I am pleased, though not surprised, when I learn how closely the movie parallels an enthralling, mind-boggling theory posited more than a century ago by the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche is the bad boy of Western philosophy, the delinquent too smart and prescient to ignore, much as we'd like to dismiss him as crazy or anti-Semitic or misguided, Nietzsche was none of these. He was, and is, the most seductive, the most inevitable of philosophers. I arrive in Sils Maria 124 years after Nietzsche. I see why he liked it. The gingerbread houses, authentic as they are adorable, the air sharp and clear, and everywhere I look, the Swiss Alps stretching skyward. If there is such a thing as Swiss dirt, I see no evidence of it. Even the trash cans are spotless. I walked a few yards from my hotel to the small house where Nietzsche lived. At the time, a shop selling tea and spices and other staples occupied the ground floor. Nietzsche rented a room on the second floor. It's been faithfully preserved, furnished, furnished simply as it was in Nietzsche's day, with a narrow bed, a small writing desk, an oriental lamp, an oriental rug, and a kerosene lamp. Simple, as I learned in Japan, need not mean lacking. Simple can be beautiful, and there's an elegant, aesthetically pleasing quality to the room. Nietzsche chose the wallpaper himself. Like the Japanese writer Sei Shonagon, he found beauty in the small. We want to be the poets of our life, first of all, in the smallest, most everyday matters, he wrote. Nietzsche craved routine. He woke early, took a cold bath, and then sat down for a monkish breakfast, raw eggs, tea, and aniseed biscuit. During the day, he wrote and walked. In the evening, between seven and nine, he sat still in the dark. An admirably rigid routine, but hardly heroic. Where, I wonder, is the philosophical daredevil, the aeronaut of the spirit, as he liked to call himself? Physically, Nietzsche was no superhero, as the black and white photos on display here attest. They portray a wisp of a person, more mustache than man. The mustache, bushy and Bismarckian, enhanced the opacity Nietzsche cultivated. It tricked people into thinking he was someone he was not. One of the few philosophers to celebrate health as a virtue, Nietzsche enjoyed precious little himself. From age 13, Nietzsche suffered from migraine headaches that, along with a panoply of other ailments, plagued him throughout his life. His terrible eyesight worsened over the years. He suffered fits of vomiting that lasted hours. Some days he couldn't get out of bed at all. He tried many med medical interventions, and for someone otherwise so skeptical, was remarkably susceptible to quackery. One doctor prescribed a regimen of nothingness. No water, no soup, no vegetables, no bread. Nothing, that is, except the leeches he applied to Nietzsche's earlobes. Nietzsche felt death's shadow keenly. His books are written in the urgent prose of a man who knew his days were numbered. If it's possible for a place to save a life, Sils Maria saved Nietzsche's. Yes, he still experienced headaches and stomach upset, but these bouts were far milder. The alpine air calmed his nerves, too. He could breathe again. He birthed his biggest ideas here. It was in Sils Maria that he pronounced, God is dead, one of philosophy's most brazen assertions. It was in Sils Maria that he conjured his dancing prophet and alter ego, Zarathustra, a fictionalized version of the Persian prophet who descends from the mountain to share wisdom with humanity. And it was in Sils Maria that his greatest thought, the thought of thoughts, struck him with a ferocity he did not think possible. It was August 1881. Nietzsche was on one of his usual walks along the shores of Lake Silvaplana, high above sea level, 6,000 feet beyond man and time. He had just come across a mighty pyramidal block of stone when the thought of thoughts arrived unbidden, an earthquake of an idea that led to a rethinking of the universe and our place in it as well as a major motion picture starring Bill Murray and Andy McDowell. 
The idea hit him hard and fast, heated and expanded to unimaginable size. Only later did it cool and congeal into these words. Imagine you are visited in the dead of night by a demon who says to you, this life as you live it now and have lived it, you will have to live again and again, times without number, and there will be nothing new in it but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and all the unspeakably small and great in your life must return to you. And everything in the same series and sequence and in the same way this spider and this moonlight among the trees and in the same way this moment and I myself, the eternal hourglass of existence will be turned again and again and you with it, you dust of dust. Nietzsche is not speaking of reincarnation. You do not return as the same soul in a different body. It is the self-same you that returns again and again. You do not, like Phil Connors of Groundhog Day, recall your previous iterations. You cannot, like Phil, edit your recurring life. Everything has happened before, and it will happen again exactly the same way forever. All of it, even seventh grade and the year 2020. How would you respond to the demon, asked Nietzsche. Would you gnash your teeth and curse the demon who thus spoke? Or would you bow down before the demon and say, you are God and never did I hear anything more divine? Nietzsche called his idea eternal recurrence of the same. It enthralled him. It terrified him. He walked, practically ran back to his simple room in Sils Maria. And for the next few months, despite excruciating head and eye pain, he could think of little else. I wake to another day in Sils Maria. I brush my teeth, just like yesterday, and splash cold water on my face. I shave, nicking my cheek again, and tumble downstairs to the breakfast room, the same room where Nietzsche dined regularly. I see the same hostess as yesterday and the day before, and who once again tolerates my garbled Guttenmagen and seats me at the same table by the same window. At the buffet station, I find the same choices, the same hunks of Jarlsberg, the same flaky croissants, and the same fruit salad arranged in the same perfect semicircle. I order a coffee, just as I did yesterday and the day before, and pour precisely the same amount of milk. As I stand to leave, the hostess says, have a nice day, just as she did yesterday and the day before. And once again, I think, but do not, do not say yes, but not too nice. I walk past the front desk again and say hello to Laura, who today, like yesterday and the day before, is wearing lederhosen. I step outside to a perfect Swiss day, a day like yesterday and the day before, and I set out on one of the nearby hiking trails. It is a different hiking trail from yesterday, and as Bill Murray's exasperated character in Groundhog Day says, different is good. I am on a mission, not from God, we killed him, Nietzsche reminds me, but from Zarathustra, Nietzsche's dancing prophet. I am determined to find the mighty stone, the place where the philosopher first imagined eternal recurrence, by seeing it, by touching it. I hope to think what he thought that day, better yet, to feel what he felt. And that's a little bit from the Socrates Express. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Stephen. You're welcome, Stephen. <laughs> we're just going to play the loop now for the next hour. Just <laughs> no, we're, we're going to we're going to put you in the in the green room, and we're going to put Stephen on, and then you'll come back in a little bit. I say, Stephen, it's nice to see you again. We were fellows, and yeah. <laughs> And Susan, it's nice to see you again. You too. I have never been at the VCCA with either of these two characters. So this is quite <laughs> delightful to spend time with Eric and Steven tonight. Well, I, I um, the last time I was host, I, I was peddling um, a bottle of wine. Uh, our friends over at Sweetbriar, John Gregory Brown and Carrie Brown's son, um, has this great winery, but that I'm not I'm not peddling his wine tonight. So when the three of us are fellows sometime, hopefully next year, and we will be reopening um, for the summer <laughs> and um, applications are due January 15th, by the way. But this is my favorite new wine. Actually, I don't know if it's gonna show up. It's called Shit Show, a fine wine for the times. <laughs> That's uh, good. It's delicious. And um, this little gift tag comes um, from a friend of ours, Susan. It's from Appalachia Press. And, I see, um, lovely. Lovely. We want to promote him. Yes, our friend John Reburn. And so that all your fine letterpress needs. <laughs> yeah. 
So enough about all that. And um, let me introduce you and then you're gonna take us on. Sure, a, cool a little uh, slide journey. Uh, Susan Jameson's feminine iconography spans several media, including painting, drawing, textile-based sculpture and installation, all steeped in ritualistic and mythological associations. You're best known for your intricate egg tempura paintings, which present a mystery cult of florid women who foray into the wild and commune with animal spirit guides or familiars. And Susan, you live in Roanoke, Virginia. So I sure do. Get away, my friend. All righty. Um, so I think they're going to pull up my slide presentation. Terrific, here it is. Um, I just want to thank everyone at VCCA who is doing this for us, first of all. Um, it's really a place that's near and dear to my heart, and um, I'm sure everyone that's been there misses the connection that we all share with that place when it is open. Um, I began this year working on a sculptural project. Um, as Stephen said, I'm more known for my paintings, but I like to make these sort of textile-based sculptures. And this is a project I envisioned called The Mother. And she is a life-scale wool figure made of wool felt. And she will have these sort of cords coming out of this opening in her body. The body, the opening is lined in red velvet and there'll be these cords coming out and then various plants and animals attached to the cords. And the idea behind this is that, you know, this, this female figure, this mother figure is birthing out uh, life on our planet, really. So I hope to get back to her. She, she kind of hangs out in my bedroom and frankly, it's a little creepy, but I hope to get back to her soon and start working on her again. So um, I'm trying to advance the slide. Having a little technical difficulty advancing. So we might need Kim to help me advance the slide. So we'll try to we'll try to troubleshoot this together. Um, Let me try this. Okay, we're on slide two. So, yeah, this is slide two. And um, basically, at the beginning of the year, I was scheduled uh, to go to New Orleans for this wonderful opening of a show at the Ogden Museum of Art, um, curated by Bradley Summerall. It's called Entwined, Ritual Wrapping and Binding in Contemporary Southern Art. And I have five paintings in this show. They're mostly older works. I was pretty excited about the trip, but we all know what happened. COVID hit and we were unable to um, have the trip. And so, but here you see an image of some people at the museum installing this painting. And the reason I put this in here is just so people could see this, the scale of this piece. It's 88 by 72 inches. So it's rather large. Um, the show is extended to February 28th. I haven't totally given up hope that I'll be able to take this trip down there. Um, so hopefully that will happen eventually. This is a singular image of what that piece looks like above the pack from 2010. And probably what you can't see in the image, um, there are little red threads that suspend this figure and the lace that's draped over her arm reads enchantment. I don't wanna to spend too long on these slides because these are older images that are just in the show. This is Re Weaving Ritual from 2016, a smaller piece that's in the show. Nevermore Tighter from 2015. And these all have to do with um, sort of wrapping and binding. This is a large scale piece. So this figure in the that you're seeing in here, she is as tall as me and the binding around her has words on the on the lace that binds her and it says, touch me, why don't you touch me? Speak to me, why don't you speak to me? So it could be interpreted either as 
sort of a flirty thing or, you know, kind of a, a begging thing. You know, why don't you touch me? Or why don't you touch me? So um, uh, this is in the collection of uh, Kate Ogden, who um, has generously loaned it to the show at the Ogden Museum. Um, she's unrelated to the museum, but I thank Kate for loaning this piece to the show and extending the loan. This is a piece called Lee's Lace, and it is an homage to uh, Alexander McQueen, who was the British designer who sadly died in 2010, I think it was, but um, visual artists take cues from a lot of different places, not just from other art. And he, um, his work was, was really an inspiration to me. So I kind of envisioned this piece as an homage to his, his work. And he did make a garment that was very similar to this that the model was actually sewn into. So this piece is something um, that I made in 2018. I do think I was at the VCCA when I made this. Uh, um, one thing about my work that I'd like to share is that it's visionary, meaning I see visions in my head of the whole thing totally completed and I simply make what I see almost like paint by numbers. Um, in 2018, I started to get these messages and it, <laughs> the messages said, depict the divine feminine, it's time for her return. And I thought, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> so, but um, I was, when I was young, my mother raised us Catholic. And so I had grown up with that background. And I kind of, you know, even though I'm not a practicing Catholic, I did look into that kind of iconography for who these feminine characters would be and um, started using this rose as an emblem for, you know, uh, the Virgin Mother and, or that divine feminine character. So here you see her and she's kind of spraying these rose petals out of her hands through, you know, what appear to be something like stigmata. But I sort of envisioned her sort of showering the world with these rose petals in this sort of healing gesture. And I was supposed to have a show early in the spring called The Frequency of Roses titled after the spring. And it was canceled and then it was rescheduled for the fall and canceled again. It was supposed to be at Chroma Projects in Charlottesville. But unfortunately we just we just couldn't um, we couldn't do it with everything happening this year. So um, yeah, I continue to make these sort of rose uh, inspired images. So here is a painting that's very dark. You may have a hard time seeing it, but I got this image in my head of a black horse running at night. And this was kind of late in 2019. And um, I thought, well, that's an improbable scene that, that, you know, this horse would be at full gallop running through the night. And it seemed to me kind of a foreboding image and something that was a little bit scary. But I realized that um, for me, the idea behind it was, um, in what way do we face the darkness and become fearless? So I titled it Fearless She Is. And um, shortly after that, I saw this with this white horse and the rainbow. And I kind of thought that was gonna immediately follow the darkness. So I hope these are premonitions of, you know, the time we've gone through and where we're headed um, and that there's some brightness and relief coming soon. Um, this painting hangs behind my sofa. It's this one right here that you can see behind me. And um, I've really enjoyed actually living with this painting through, through this time. It's kind of giving me hope. And I titled it, I Will Always Love You, the famous Dolly Parton song that was sung by Whitney Houston so beautifully. And I didn't know that Dolly Parton was gonna be like this huge savior of 2020, but there she is. So um, that's, my, that's my vision for the future. 
Um, here's a piece I did in very late 2019. I was doing a lot of yoga classes. Thank you, Kelly Kemper. And I was doing these yoga classes. And if you have ever taken the yoga class before, you do this sort of little meditation after the class is over. And I got this vision of this, this celestial woman made of stars with this sort of crystal, um, glowing crystal heart structure. And she was exhaling these rose petals throughout the galaxy. So I called that hover over me after um, uh, a saint that, that I won't go into, but <laughs> so that's another sort of like something I was looking into uh, women in the Catholic Church that were important. So in 2000, early in 2020, I found out that the building where my studio is is going to be up for sale, and I started moving my artwork home, not really knowing where to go or what to do. But fortunately in my apartment, I have a nice size dining room, which is kind of unusual in an apartment. And that's a five by five foot table. And in the, the back corner there, you see some paintings propped up against a wall. And there's a fairly large piece there where you see a full scale figure on it. And that is what I have been working on for most of this, you know, most of the year really is that that painting and um so somebody asked me to create this painting and she wanted a female figure and she said she you know wanted the figure to be nude but not revealing too much and she wanted a tree and a deer and so usually when i'm working on something for somebody with these kinds of requests i wait for that vision of what i'm trying to make for them to come and it was not coming and it was not coming and it was not coming but i took a walk uh down a trail near close to where i live one day and i saw this tree and all of a sudden i saw the tree and i saw the woman emerging from the tree and you you can tell what this tree looks like i mean it looks like a vulva um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I guess I just did. So it looks like a, a vulva. And so I kind of imagine this woman <clears throat> emerging from, you know, this mother earth tree. And she is laying her hands on this deer, this white deer in a healing gesture in the painting. And I want to show you how I kind of storyboard something like this. I have some friends in Richmond, then this white deer appeared in their yard years and years and years ago, and they were sending me pictures of it, and I've saved them all. So I had the pictures of the deer, this really rough, sloppy sketch of what, what it might look like with this woman coming out of the tree. And so I put all these things together and um, start, you know, creating the image. And then I draw the whole image on a piece of tracing paper the same size as the panel. So the drawing is like, is, you know, the life size of the panel. And then I put Conte crayon, which is like chalk on the back. This is called making a cartoon. And this is something they would have done in the Renaissance era to uh, start a painting, like an oil painting, an egg temper painting, certainly. I do it this way because egg tempera is not very changeable. You can't, you can't easily wash it off um, or mush it around. You have to actually scrape it off once it's on there. So I tend to work this way and I make the cartoon and I transfer it to the panel. And then I very roughly kind of go in with first layers of the paint. So you can see my little helper, that's my cat Sophie, who's here right next to me right now. And she's inspecting the work and making sure it's good. And so I've roughed in the basic kind of um, shapes of what's going on with some flesh tone. And then you can see here, I lay it flat, I work flat. Anyone that's ever sort of hung out with me at BCCA knows that, that I don't I don't use an easel or anything like that. I put everything flat on a table and then I just, you know, every now and again, I, I tip it back up to look at it and make sure it looks the way I need it to. But it's kind of funny, like just to see this here in my dining room, this big painting, uh, flipping it up and down. 
but I thought you might like seeing that. And there's the completed piece. It, I called it the healing. And to me, um, you know, that image just really kind of helped me get through 2020, just working on this image that made me feel um, hopeful and inspired and in touch with the outdoors and the earth. And, um, you know, that's another vision that I had for the future. So I tend to react to difficult or trying situations by um, creating images of what I would rather see. <laughs> um, this was a, from a group of photographs I did. My friend Travis uh, Childers has this project, uh, a gallery in his house in Northern Virginia. He calls it Ruby Projects. And he wanted to do a show called Self-Isolation. So I did a bunch of photographs of myself with these rose petals kind of stuck to my face and all up in my hair. You can, I think I might have more on Instagram. Um, but then I was curious to see what that would look like translated into a painting. So I made this painting, which is a totally different animal, I guess. But, you know, going back to that theme of roses and this um, kind of healing quality of roses. Um, so there we go. I'm working on a few more roses. These are in progress. I had intended intended to finish them, but my work has been kind of slow this year. And so I haven't been in major production mode constantly. Here's another one I'm working on for a friend that wanted an owl in this um, saying in Polish, which uh, means something to the effect of wait and see, or, you know, if we live, we'll see, which I think is also very 2020. Um, I want to give some shout outs to some people that have included my work in their work. So uh, my friend Sarah Elizabeth made this beautiful book, Art of the Occult, which is on Amazon. And she included my work in this book. And, um, her, that's her Unquiet Things is where she writes about all kinds of things that she's interested in, perfume and books and crochet and she's just a fascinating person so thank you so much to Sarah um, for putting this wonderful book together um, thank you to the Saranac Review for uh, this amazing um, journal literary journal and it's all filled with images of my work and um, I don't know how many color images are in this thing, but that was beautiful and that was supposed to be distributed this year, but I, you know, I don't know if they had much luck with that due to COVID, but thank you to them. Thank you to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts uh, who granted me a pandemic relief grant this year. And I just want to thank everyone over there for supporting me and the other artists that were sipping were recipients of these grants. I, I really appreciate it. Couldn't have gotten through the year without this. Um, and this is <laughs> my horse painting. And I just wanna say my little cat there, Sophie, this is the only painting I've ever made where she is keenly interested in it. She spends a lot of time looking at it. And I, you know, I kind of wonder what she's thinking, but I guess she recognizes that it's an animal um, but she does look at a lot, which I think is kind of interesting. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to 2021. And if you're like me and you had kind of a mm, more sleepy year and it wasn't, you know, super productive, I think we just need to have some radical forgiveness for ourselves and, and just, you know, settle into some resting and try to get through the rest of the year. But um, uh, that is it for my my image presentation and just uh thank you for watching thank you susan that i was not familiar with your work and it's 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 beautiful it's provocative and um and i really like the balance of the horse going in one direction and your cat really with the same <laughs> going in the other one um kim can we bring eric back too and um, 
where you are. Thank you, Susan. That was great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. And I just want to say hi to um, Sheila Pleasance, who is in the audience. And we always are so thankful, Sheila, for everything that you do. We love us. Sheila. <laughs> yay, yay, Sheila. And um, and we thank all of the staff for everything that they have um, that they, they do, and they've been doing this year. Um, I think you may know that we're going to have private bathrooms when we come back, which of course is yeah, you know, a really big deal. I think that is that is huge. Yes, uh, I saw um, earlier. Delise Blanchard said hello to you, Eric. And Delise, I know you have a show that's taking place in Lynchburg now of your work. If you have a link and you want to post it, please do. Um, I want to do everything we can to, to help everybody here. Uh, I'm going to ask um, a couple of questions myself, and then I see if we have we have questions here. Uh, Eric, I'm wondering, who is your favorite of your dead philosophers? Uh, it's like saying, who's your favorite child, you know? Sure. But uh, not one child. I know that. Yeah, OK, that's true. That's easy. Um, I, know, I know the answer to that one. OK. <laughs> Um, if I had to choose two to have uh, a, a glass of beer with or a, a cup of tea, uh, it would be I would narrow it down to Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, Montaigne, Michel de Montaigne, uh, for for quite different reasons. Um, Gandhi, I was quite familiar with, um, having lived in India and studied him for a long time. And Montaigne was new to me. Um, so uh, those two, I would say. Good answer. Um, Montaigne, because he, you know, he he wrote these essays. In fact, he invented the form of the essay in the 16th century. And he was living during a time of pandemic, much like ours. Um, he was the mayor of the city of Bordeaux in southern France. And he fled uh, to his uh, chateau, much as I imagine you have done, Stephen, and um, went up to his tower, three stories up, and there he sat and he thought and he wrote and he, and he grew increasingly confident in his voice. At first in the essays, he's quoting uh, the, the great philosophers of what was even back then ancient times, Seneca and uh, Cicero and others. And but as he goes on, he grows increasingly confident of his own voice and his own view of things. And um, I found that relatable. Right. Susan, Dr. Harrison has a question here. What is the significance of wrapping and binding in your works? You know, that's an interesting question, because when the curator of that show contacted me and he ran the idea behind me, uh, you know, about this wrapping and binding, I was kind of dumbfounded. I didn't really see that I had so many paintings with, um, well, I knew I had lots of threads and things like that, but I, I guess I didn't really realize that that was a reoccurring theme until uh, Bradley pointed it out. And um, so I think, I think for me, it's kind of about connections, you know, connections, ways of making connections, connections between um, humans, between us and the natural world. Um, and also, you know, with these red threads and the lace and all this kind of stuff, there is a thought in my mind to sort of have an homage to women's work. You know, there was certainly a time in history when women, and that still can be now, are not take, taken seriously as artists or painters, but you were allowed to do needlecraft or sewing, embroidery or lace making or things like that. So I think I started putting those kinds of in my work, uh, you know, to honor that those kinds of crafting things. So, so Stephen, if I can try to uh, put a little connective tissue between my work and Susan's, um, there's that famous line from the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau who said, Man is born free and everywhere he's in chains. Um, so maybe that's what you had in mind? <laughs> I don't know. These, the idea is that, you know, in the natural world, Rousseau believed we are free and happy and it's society that puts us in chains and binds us and makes us unhappy, essentially. I don't, know. I don't necessarily see all the binding as being unhappy. I kind of see a bit of a push and a pull 
-hmm. certainly with the works that are, you know, in that show. And I think, you know, some of what I'm trying to show with, with the wrapping, with the binding is about connection. Like the image where you have, it's either two women or one woman and, you know, this garden spider threaded in between into their fingers, but also in between their fingers and this sort of spell casting gesture. It's sort of like, you know, making a connection between right. us in that natural world and the natural inclination of that orb weaver to, to be making these structures and of women to be sewing and mending and binding and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so I do really appreciate Bradley putting that show together and including my work in it and, and sort of pointing that out to me that it, it was this kind of repeated thematic thing. Um, and he wrote some, you know, really nice, uh, kind of essay kind of work mm -hmm. on the website of the Ogden. So yeah. yeah. I think I think the wrapping and binding, there's there's it cuts both ways. It does. It does. I mean, and even you know can connect, they can connect us or they can uh strangle us, you know, depending exactly. On exactly. Yeah. yeah. So Eric, it you know if I know from your previous work, travel has been a little bit of your secret sauce. Yeah. Um and travel has been um, prohibited uh, these 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 months. How has how is this impacting what you are working on next? If, and can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, it's affected my mental health a bit. I would say um, I, I briefly started uh, this ad hoc YouTube show called the Pajama Travel Club. <laughs> I, I would get dressed in my pajamas and I would read from my work or other writers travel works or interview a friend in Tokyo who is in her pajamas also. Um, so I coped. Um, you know, it's forced stillness and it's forced me to sit still, which is not something I've done most of my life. I have been this sort of lifelong traveler. Um, I'll just say that it is making you know i'm supposed to be pivoting to a new project and it's tricky um because my books have depended on they're not travel books per se but travel is the so the vehicle so to speak that takes me from idea to idea and i'm trying to figure out a way to do that um when it looks like i hate to say it for most of 2021 i don't know how much traveling we'll be doing it's certainly not the kind of global travel that I, I usually do for my work. Um, so I am, if you have any ideas, I'm trying to figure out um, how to write a, uh, a book that conveys the spirit of travel without actually traveling. Well, you know, some of, some of the um, most far ranging travels I have taken have been inside my own mind. Right. And you know, that, <laughs> that whole notion of stillness, uh, there's a lot to be explored there. Right. But, myself um and susan one one last question for you here so yeah eric and i as as as, as writers you know we work on something it's delivered and it's published and that can be like years um it seems like uh, your work really especially the work some of the work you show tonight really reflects this year this now um is that, is it always really so contemporaneous like that? I think in the art world, there, there are different kinds of exhibition opportunities that one would be getting ready for. Um, the work that you saw from the Ogden Museum, generally museum shows would be curated from, you know, your, an artist's inventory. It could go back years according to the curator's vision. It could be things that have been previously sold and borrowed back for the show. Um, you know, if I'm getting ready for a show, then I do have some sort of singular vision and I'm creating work for that show. But I think for me personally, um, it, my work is really driven by those images that come to me. And, mm -hmm. and now this idea, you know, depict the divine feminine, like what, <laughs> what am I hearing? Why am I hearing that? That's to me, it was just kind of um, a surprise, a bizarre surprise and, um, you know, something to investigate. But, yeah, I think there is a difference in um, 
in sort of, you know, that time lapse that writers are going to have and, and how you work with, um, I guess, your editors, you know, who help you go through things and a publisher. But, you know, artists do have gallerists that they work with. The gallerists I've generally worked with um, are not as keen on editing what I'm doing. They're more, they've been more people who are just on board showing what it is I'm doing. But yeah, I think, I think for me, especially this year in 2019, what was coming to me seemed to be very reflective of the time we're living in right now, which is kind of eerie um, and surprising in some ways. But you know, I'm just kind of trying to stay in whatever flow I'm in to be a receiver of these things to, you know, and create them to the best of my ability. I'm looking forward to get, getting back to that mother sculpture because she was sort of put uh, to the side to create some of these paintings that I was doing, you know, uh, at the request of other people. Thanks. Um, while you were talking, Christina Chu posted, um, Susan, you look so beautiful tonight. And Christina has her book Beauty out and she is a true beauty and somebody I've been at VCCA with a couple times. So we are very good friends. And as you both know, you know, you make such wonderful relationships through the VCCA. And Eric, you're beautiful too. I just want you to know. Hey, I was waiting for that. Thank I you. <laughs> yeah, I felt um, left out. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody want to say anything to me? Yeah. Okay. Steven, you look that's, very, uh, that very sweater, pretty tonight. The sweater is you. Yeah. Sweater. It's very, very Christmassy sweater. You're glowing, really. Thank you. <laughs> so let me let me ask. I'm going to ask all of us this question, and then we'll 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 call it a night. Um, and Eric, you you referred a little bit to your mental health. I have found I have found these months to be to be challenging to my mental health uh, as well. And you know, as we go into this, you know, we're we're approaching the solstice um, this weekend, early next week, the shortest day of the year. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of real darkness. There's a lot of metaphoric darkness. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, if there's one thing that you're going to try to do over these next months to um, to cope to as a strategy to, to get to the other side. And um, hmm. Eric, why don't you go first? And I'll... Okay. I mean, it's, it, it is a real problem. Um, and I think um, I was telling you before we went live here that I, I've never really been that affected, I think, by by the change of the seasons in terms of winter darkness and depression. But this year, it seems to have really brought me down and uh, the, the days ending so early. Um, and I find that rituals help and they need not be religious rituals. They can certainly be secular rituals of, you know, you really this whole experience has reinforced this idea I've always had that we need these rituals to hold us up. Um, you know, whether it's making the cup of coffee, the extra slow, tedious way with, you know, the grinding and the pouring and the filter. Um, and, um, you know, and, and having some structure to days that could become like groundhog day, you know, where they are just blurring into each other um and also um you know i tend to be at my worst taskmaster sort of always whipping myself to produce more and as susan sort of alluded to you know we should cut ourselves cut ourselves some slack that maybe That's 2020 horrible. is not going to be our most productive year where i you know write three books and you you know paint 12 beautiful paintings and stephen writes 3000 columns and decorates his tree i mean I guess combination of rituals and some some slack, which might also be called self for kindness, really, um, is uh, you know is what I'm I'm trying to get through. In addition to books, of course. In the beginning, I couldn't really read. I could binge watch Netflix, and in the last couple of months, though, I'm turning back to my old books and rereading books and reading books, and um, and finally, I'm able to get back into the. the the world of words again. Um, and that's a good sign, I think. You know, th th that part about going, I I've been going back to books that I have loved because I've really been un really un unable to read new books. And it's, it's part of going back to things I know to comfort um, to a different time as well. Um, 
Many yeah. people are, are um, confessing in the comments that they're wearing their pajamas now and they wish you were in your pajamas, Eric. <laughs> and um, I, I that, could be, that could be arranged. Yeah, there's something about pajamas that are just cozy and yeah. They are. And uh, Sheila and Kim, since uh, we're going to do some programming for next year, and before I forget this, you know, we should do children's authors and um, it should be like a bedtime reading and they, the folks should be wearing their pajamas. Um, so, Susan, how, how about you? What, um, what are you doing to take care of yourself? I have to confess, I haven't been taking care of myself very well this year. I've been overeating slacking back on my exercise, not, not really taking care of myself very well at all. Um, I am a person who works alone. I live alone. I'm introverted. I don't travel much. I don't like to, <laughs> I like to be at home with my cat. So I'm kind of really made for a pandemic, but I'm also a person who's very sensitive to, to other people's uh, feelings and emotions. So I think a lot of that is coming at me. And um, what I've started to do that is helping is more walks out in the woods, starting that back out again. And um, my small neighborhood here has a lot of Christmas lights up and they put a lot of Halloween decorations up. So around Halloween, I started walking at night, which it sounds strange, but my neighborhood is relatively safe. And I kind of feel like the night walks are strangely comforting because the streets are mostly empty, you know, with the holiday lights up, it, you know, it's kind of beautiful and nostalgic. And um, there's something about embracing the darkness that is meaningful to me right now. And I, I, I do have to say again, you know, if you haven't had like a super productive year, this idea of like radical self-acceptance for, everything you didn't do just let that go and you know kind of roll with where we're at you know and and be okay with what what you didn't do or weight you gained or whatever it is you think you did wrong just just let that go and keep moving forward because i do think i do think brighter times are coming and you know i think we'll be okay i like your optimism and I want to thank both of you, Susan Jamison, Eric Wiener, Kim Doty, behind the scenes. And thank you so much, Kim. Hi, <laughs> Kim, wherever you are. And Sheila and everyone who um, is watching us um, and in your pajamas. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.